From McMaster University, I'm John Preston, and you're listening to Big Ideas for a Changing World. In this series, you'll hear from researchers from McMaster's Faculty of Engineering and beyond who are creating innovative solutions to our world's greatest challenges. I have the chance to see some of these solutions up close as the faculty's Associate Dean for Research and External Relations. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. In September, I had the pleasure of moderating a panel discussion at the Global Engineering Dean's Council's Industry Forum. It was called the Inspirational Panel Pursuing the Positives, Setting the Agenda for the Future of Engineering Education. A long title, but it was a fitting one. I was joined by several global leaders in engineering education and industry to talk about the advantages and challenges of e-learning, a shift in culture of innovation, and how we might make the most of the transformations to education that were required by the pandemic, but may carry on into the future. We'll hear from Joris Melkert, Director of Education in the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering at TU Delft in the Netherlands. We'll hear from Charlotte Negesson, co-founder and CEO of Base Group, an African digital identity software company and the 2020 recipient of the Royal Academy of Engineering's Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation. And we'll hear from Colin Tan, Director of Operation at Tusk Park UK, a growing science and tech incubator. We're sharing a slightly edited version of this discussion with you today. Special thanks to GDC and Petrus for organizing the industry forum in partnership with McMaster Engineering, and also for allowing us to share it with all of you today. Welcome everyone. My name is John Preston. I'm the Associate Dean for Research, Innovation and External Relations at McMaster. I'd like to welcome you to our panel this morning where we will be trying to come up with some inspirational comments around the evolution of education and where we, we may end up. Before I, I open up the questions, well, first of all, it's sort of the, I have a number of questions to lead off with with the panel but I would certainly appreciate getting input from the global community, both industry representatives and educational representatives. So please put your questions into, into chat, questions and comments. I will be looking at them, but there are also a number of other people who will be carefully looking at them and we'll be trying to bring as many of those to fore as we possibly can. So with that, I will, uh, I will ask each of our panelists to give us uh, an introduction to themselves and perhaps tell us something interesting that, that they view as, as being that they will be bringing to the panel. And I'll do that in the order that they, they appear in my notes, just for, uh, to avoid confusion. And so I will begin with Colin Tan. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Colin. Just to intro myself, I'm, I'm a, a tech entrepreneur and an investor as well. Um, a few years ago, I was part of uh, helping out the north of England. Uh, there was a government uh, sort of uh, endeavor to create something called the Northern Powerhouse. And I currently run Tusk Park, Newcastle, which is in Newcastle, the north of England. And Tusk Park is uh, a spin out of Tsinghua University. Uh, it's a Chinese university, um, the top Chinese university for engineering and sciences. It was spun out about 30 years ago in China and Beijing to create the Silicon Valley area of China. And we are the, the first international base of Task Park. And we exist to help UK companies, uh, spin outs, uh, innovations, uh, innovations uh, entering into the Chinese market, especially where we have about 200 bases um, but we have a few other bases, for example, Singapore, where I'm from, and it, we are, we're here to serve the ecosystem in the UK. All right, thank you. Next on the list is Charlotte Nguyen. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlotte Nguyen. I'm from Ivory Coast, but I'm based in Ghana. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Base Group. And basically, Base Group is a software company. We are based in Ghana. We provide a digital identity verification system using facial recognition and AI technologies, help uh, businesses, especially financial institutions, to verify their clients' identities remotely, in real time, and from anywhere in Africa. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And so be free to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Joris Melkert. 
Hello, good, good afternoon. My name is Joris Melkert. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer by, uh, by training. Uh, I'm working at the Faculty of Aerospace Engineering of Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, this tiny country in the north of Europe, uh, where it always rains and where it's always cold. Uh, recently recently promoted to, to Director of Education, uh, but I have a broad experience in, uh, in teaching. Uh, so I was in direct contact with students on a daily basis since March. That's, that's no longer the case, unfortunately. Uh, but I bring to the, to the panel uh, yeah, quite some experience in uh, engineering teaching. Uh. Right, excellent. So on to the first question. And this is a extremely optimistic question, perhaps not in terms of timeline, but certainly in terms of result. So the year is now 2024. There is a vaccine and it's been remarkably effective. COVID-19 is a thing of the past. How is engineering education better? more fit for purpose, for skills, for research, for innovation? And how did we get there? I think the, the thing I've done first is to have taken a very long holiday to recover from this uh, pandemic and the virus. <laughs> uh, and then the second thing we should consider that we now have probably had the opportunity to teach students a, a bit more better digital skills. Uh, we also have seen the value of face-to-face -face education, but we've also now given them an extra training into acquiring knowledge online in a proper way, assessing that the, the proper way. So we have opened up a new opportunity for, for, for adding knowledge to uh, knowledge and maybe also skills to, to the students. In addition to what the traditional education had to offer, they have much more digital skills uh, and they're better prepared for a lifelong learning process. Uh. I think that's true. The digital skills of the students is developing extremely rapidly, perhaps a little more rapidly than for the professorate. Charlotte, can you make some comments about how young engineers may be better at that point and perhaps more entrepreneurial? Yes, thank you, John. Actually, I think that at that time, I mean, I believe that I think we have changed a lot and people right now uh, understand the use of uh, digital, online learning, online courses. And we'll be able, I think if we want to innovate, actually, we have to think about simulation because right now, even we are doing online courses, but students can even actually uh, simulate some practical exercise and it will be the time for everyone to innovate in the educational aspect but also bring uh, simulation software to make sure that uh, even I'm working from home I'm able to uh, uh, practice what I'm learning as like a technical skills. My, one of my contributions in terms of or which kind of innovation you can bring in the education. Colin, what, what are your thoughts? I actually, strange. I, I, I hope that um, by 2024, the thing that's left behind in everyone's minds is how important the face-to-face -face is. And rather, you know, you know and, and we need to cling on to the things that we have been teaching as, as engineering. You know, there are some things that are not replaceable, not just the collaboration, but also the equipment. You know, I mean, there are some physical things that needs to be done. And because we live in a, in a physical world, I, I think that uh, by 24, you know, by, by three years time, because as you said, uh, we are already sort of digitizing and, and, and the students are already entering this, this mindset and even institutions are entering this mindset of uh, going online, you know. Um, so so I, I think that's, that's heading more or less in the right direction. But I, I think, I, I hope that, uh, that we also have a, uh, we sort of cling on to what's kind of important. So maybe, there will be a, a kind of dichotomy, a kind of um, diversification here about uh, uh, soft skills, collaboration skills, um, ecosystems, you know, um, networking, finding opportunities and being entrepreneurial as one kind of a engineering mindset, but also having the disciplines and uh, uh, you know, what we traditionally would, would call, you know, um, uh, what makes us engineers. Let me ask, uh, there's been a, and I don't know to the extent this is perhaps a North American phenomenon. We're within Canada, we're often dominated by uh, news from the United States. But there has been some retrenchion, some pushback against globalization, globalization almost being seen as the as an enabler of the pandemic. How important do you think that's going to be? I mean, we're in a, we're, this is an organization with global in its title. This is a very global panel. Colin represents uh, an important stretch in terms of spanning innovation across, across continents. 
are we going to continue along a path of becoming increasingly global or is this actually going to turn us back and become more local and regional as a result of the pandemic? Colin, I think I'll ask, I'll start with you since you do represent you. an interesting perspective here. And actually, it's one of those things that I've been having a kind of a passion about, you know, um, because uh, I've been trying to puzzle this out my, myself. So humanly, we've, we've seen the world coming together and that's really amazing. And we see that in the production, you know, YouTube videos and, and many, many um, uh, sorts of bits of media. So, and you get a, a lot of uh, collective voices as well. Strangely, politically, you know, of course, you know, there's a whole lean towards the other direction. Uh, but my, my, my unique perspective, because for the last few months, I, I work with very early stage companies in Newcastle, and we are running a clean energy accelerator at a minute. So one of the, the strengths of Northeast England is um, the, the offshore renewable energy, sort of, a, a, they call it the catapult system. It's a government funded system to help SMEs in the UK. So we're running a, a accelerator in a minute, and um, and that's going pretty well. So, and and we have seen, in fact, uh, up on the ground, sort of a, a lot of appetite as well from small SMEs, from startups, who are interested in internationalizing. Recently, about last week, uh, I ran a I ran a competition from Newcastle. It was was open to UK wide um, for for any SMEs who wish to access the Chinese market. This was Tsingtao. In, in the north, in the northern area of China, and you know, I mean, uh, it was quite popular. So there is there is now a, a larger group of companies, I think, um, than than five months ago, who will be interested in exploring other international markets. At the same time, again in May, I, I've noticed some other some of these, you know, markets, including Singapore and of course China, opening up themselves and having um, international uh, competitions or networking events like. The wonder we're having right now. So just just sharing this out there. Um, yeah. Any any other thoughts on how the globalization impact may may change? Uh, if I look in the, the field of aerospace engineering, that that's yeah an international world type of business. There's only two air, large aircraft manufacturers remaining in the world. Uh, China's coming up as, as well uh, there. So people are will have to work in an international setting, so it will be a global thing. On the other hand, you will also see that some things will be organized more locally. And basically now the whole world is fighting for, for equipment to fight the pandemic. And people wish they would have stored more things locally to, to be able to act, uh, react quick, more quickly. So it's probably going to be a mix. Uh, but for our field of engineering, I expect that the globalization will continue. Uh, Okay, so sticking with you, Joris, in your role as an educator, I, I had a lecture yesterday and I have a tutorial this evening, all that will be carried out remotely. Our institutions are under tremendous stress. I've not really been properly trained to teach remotely. It's something that, I mean, the university's provided many, many resources, but I certainly don't have any formal training in it. Uh, and I'm trying to adjust literally on the fly, as are many others around the globe. What are some of the most damaging aspects of those stresses and how might we mitigate those? Well, you see that literally the whole of the world is, is trying to do some patchwork. Till so we were forced to go online. Some maybe younger staff members have more experience in this online thing. Some already went into to blended learning, but many others just said, okay, I do have a standard lecture just videotape me and I'm going to broadcast this or going to make it available online. That is not the proper way of, of, of online teaching, of course, but it's probably the best uh, we can do. Uh, basically, every teacher has been working his or her butt off to, to make it happen in the last uh, couple of months, and that will continue there. Given a bit more time, we could do this more the, the, the proper way, but for the time being, it's just the best we can do uh, at the moment. But it's not, not ideal uh, for sure. Uh, and we have to be very careful that we don't miss out on important learning objectives in the, in the, in the program. We need to be very careful in uh, analyzing this. Do we miss this or do we miss that? But how do you transfer skill? How do you transfer insight? Uh, how do you transfer a proper critical academic attitude? Uh, if you do not have the opportunity to face-to-face -to -face communicate with students, uh, to see into their eyes whether they have really understood what you meant uh, to tell them, yeah, for the time being, we have to do with this, but it's not ideal, uh, and that will have potentially consequences. Uh. So it, that leads me to a, our first question from, from the audience. 
which is a question about, well, what is inevitable, that this the situation is cr increasing the gap between, uh, between based upon wealth, uh, but in particular based upon access to resources, those that have access to digital resources and are, are able to find a, a good environment in which to in which to learn have the potential to do better than those who do not have those kind of resources. So does anyone, Charlotte, I see you nodding your head. Can you maybe comment on on how you see that as playing out in the future? Yes, and actually, how will we uh, how will we recover from that for 2024? Yeah. Okay, so actually in Africa, we have some challenges about like internet accessibility and having online courses is good at some point in terms of uh, people who can, can work remotely, but some people, some students, they don't have access to internet, so they can't have access to these online courses. And unfortunately, we have a gap. It's been that if you have, I mean, you are lucky to be maybe in the city, you'll be able to get uh, educated. But for tools, they don't have, they're, they're not maybe have this kind of uh, ecosystem. It's going to be a big challenge for them. Right now, in terms of what people are trying to do, they try to teach people using TV channel, like uh, normal channels, like radio, but it's not effective because you can't have this kind of, you can't uh, talk to your students, you can't get questions actually. You just like a, or one, one channel, I teach you, you learn, but I don't know uh, if I'm able to see if you understand or not. And I'm really a little bit scared about this because we're going to have this kind of big gap between uh, the skills. Not people will be able to have the skills is required maybe to go into engineering and other aspects. So right now, I don't, I don't know uh, what they can do to solve this problem, but the only ask, the, the easy way to do just to invest, I mean, to get access, to put, go to this kind of place and put internet, help them to, help, to get access to internet, to get access to uh, the same opportunities people in the city like us, we have access right now. Because someone is uh, sitting in the village She's maybe go to school normally in a traditional way. She can't have access to what we do right now, and she'll be excluded. And that's a bit really sad for this. But yeah, there's a lot of work to do in terms of uh, online courses, online content, and remote aspect in Africa. I think one of the one of the questions this has put to rest to a certain extent is that, of course, we view clean air, water, as being essentials for quality of life. And certainly in my lifetime, the internet has gone from not existing to being a, a quirk, to being a luxury, to now being absolutely essential in terms of that connectivity is something that we really have to be, provide globally, provide access to all. It's, it's a big change. It's inevitable that, and depending on how optimistic you are, the one year, one and a half, two year period that we're going to have where uh, our educational systems are disrupted. And, and more than that, much more than that. Uh, in addition to, it's not just the structures, but people are under stress, people are having mental health challenges, et cetera. Doris, any thoughts on how universities could help in this? So these are postgraduate challenges, I guess. And another question that's come in uh, that you can also try to address is in terms of the educational challenges that we're addressing now within the university system, how can industry help? What would be the trigger that would, would help us right now? Okay, I think I can answer that. Uh, maybe, maybe if we just all the way zoom out, zoom back out, uh, what we are trying to do in universities and schools, high schools, basic, primary school, whatever, is somehow with training students, we're teaching students how to learn, how to acquire new knowledge. And actually, to a certain extent, the, the knowledge itself is important. You need to have the, the basic knowledge, skills, and insights. But to another extent, the content does not really matter anymore because we know that the people we send out into, a, into society will be there in a professional career for 40, 50 years. And I cannot predict the knowledge they need in 30, 40, 50 years from now. So just teaching them how to learn, how to acquire new knowledge is, is maybe even more important. And now we give students an extra skill to acquire knowledge online. And there's a wealth of information online available. So maybe by just little bits and pieces, they can uh, put things together themselves uh, if they have acquired that, uh, that skill. So, so these uh, bits and pieces, micro credentials, you might even call them, uh, can piece them together. 
and industry can help in that sense to, to make that information available, make proper tested information available, offer the students to, to practice skills as well via online internships or what, whatever uh, uh, industry can help. But the fact that we teach students how to learn is maybe even more important. And then now we have opened a new resource of information, of knowledge and skills. And Charlotte, I, I think I'll go to you because you were nodding, but although you're already very accomplished, you're also the youngest member, I'm guessing, on the panel. Yeah. How, are, how do you see your future education as un unrolling? Exactly. So I think that traditional education is really heavy. I mean, we are learning a lot at, at the same time. And so when we are going with online, it's very hard for students to, to handle this, I mean, learning from home and having a lot of things to do at the same time. So that's when people are trying to have a kind of mental health. For me, I believe that if you start early to speak and to talk about specialization, maybe after high school, I know that maybe I want to do engineering. I start learning in university, just like focus, not many things at a time. Because when you are bringing a lot of content, it's not difficult for uh, people to try to process all this content. And at some point they are lost and they start maybe to, to get mental health, mental issues. It's very high, but I think the future is just like, needs more people. I know to do that, I know to do that. If it's coding, I'm good in coding. If it's maybe uh, doing electronic, I'm good in electronic. Start early to do specialization. That's my, my point, you need more specialization. Mm -hmm. Colin, I'm, I'm wondering about innovation in the future. And is there, I, I think, especially in the early days of the pandemic, and shut down, there were tremendous innovations that were coming forward on very rapidly. Uh, my sense is that that's not as rapid now as it was in those early days. But one of the things that has come out and it's coming out in some of the chat questions is we found that our research programs at McMaster shifted from a traditional we're trying to get a master's or PhD degree through this process in two or four years, depending to what would be called in the startup community a sprint. We're trying to get a, we're trying to get a minimum viable product that's gonna help. And we're trying to do that in the course of six weeks, three months, whatever the time frame might be. And there are people who are thinking about pushing education more in that direction through micro-credentials and other mechanisms. Are those ways to improve innovation in the, in the long run? Yes, and, and I think, at least in the UK, I've seen it happening already over the last two years. And I, th I think the word is, is being disintermediated. You know, I mean, in, in the past, universities would think in terms of having the career services, so sort of being the main point of focus and contact with industry. But I think um, more recently, the last few years, engineering departments or even other departments, business departments, uh, would, would interact and engage directly with, um, with industry. And it, it could be as simple as having contact in there, you know, doing a talk, doing a 45 minute talk and kind of sharing uh, what they're doing, you know, in, in their company where the industry in general is, is heading towards. And then they would invite um, engagement or, or again, open innovation from the students and, and would come together in some cases the uh, industry itself would um, would support CBP, you know, uh, may support a, I think there's a, a, there's a Boeing, ATI Boeing accelerator right now, may, may support a accelerator program. And as part of these, you know, traditional learnings, they usually would coach how to do MVP, how to test and um, test your assumptions towards making a, a kind of a startup or, or, or spin out, you know. Um, so it's been quite heartening to, to watch this happen already. But these things are continuing right now as we speak. Say this aerospace uh, program right now, it's, they're, they're recruiting another batch. In UCL, in London, they are now recruiting a precision healthcare um, batch accelerator, uh, which is with uh, not just UCL, but also with BOTS. It's, it's a large health trust um, in the UK. So I think I see a lot of convergence between uh, parts of industry and parts of government, uh, at least in the UK, that, that funds innovation and spin outs. And I, I've, I see academia itself changing, you know, over the last few years. And I think it's accelerating right now. I have an idea. I think that right now, because what I'm seeing in my ecosystem, we have a lot of e-learning platforms in terms of online certification. Mm -hmm. And in the future, 
for for me, I think that more people will be okay to do online certification than going to university because getting an online certification is cheap compared to going to university and mm -hmm. if the time is even short and it's just specification i want to learn maybe uh, cyber security I, I go to cyber security and it's flexible in terms of time so if universities right now they're not working in terms of how to innovate i mean in the future we, we get few students going to school and having this traditional process today we have internet from everywhere and i mean in us uk people are, have internet more than in africa and are comfortable working from home I mean, working from home, getting access, learning from home. And for people working with university, with industry, in education, that we need to invest in innovation. Think how they can uh, bring innovation, uh, software, technology, how to make the uh, learning journey more efficient and, and more, more comfortable for, for, for us. Because right now, we are, I mean, young people like me, people like me, they're more like a, uh, they know internet already. That, that free, I mean, they're really free in terms of opportunities and they know how to get access to these opportunities, right? Mm. So you have to invest in, in, you have to work on this, make sure that the traditional process change. We don't, we don't need a traditional education right now. It's not, uh, it's not what the, the system needs. We need something more innovative, something more different. And they have to think about like the way uh, e-learning platform are doing, giving online certification, uh, making, ma ma making this more simple for us. That's compelling, compelling arguments. Uh, yours, I think you and I in our career paths may be under a little bit of stress as is maybe many of the deans in the audience if the traditional, if the traditional education system is not up to the task. Maybe put it to you to try to get, provide a defense. How is the traditional engineering educational system going to adapt to these challenges coming from these new online platforms that are able to deliver certainly curriculum, maybe faster and certainly less expensive than, than a traditional university. I think the best defense is just to fully embrace them, uh, to, to take them up into the, into the system. On the other hand, I would like to, to give a, a, a caution here. And I've seen this in the discussion with industry uh, several times. If you go to industry and you ask them, what do you want? Then they say, I want an engineer that does this, this, and this, and preferably this, this, and that. They want basically too much and also rather narrow because we want them to uh, operate this, this, and this specific type of software. Well, in 10 years, that's probably obsolete. Uh, but what's important that we also train our engineers that they're able to adapt to new things. As, again, as I already said, told before, teach them how to learn, how to acquire new knowledge, skills, and insights. And that can be at any level for any topic, uh, as long as they're able to, to adapt to that. But for sure, we need to embrace the, the opportunities that's given to us by, by, the, by ICT in, in those days. And we see this already from the young students. They are much, much faster in uh, adapting uh, to this. On the other hand, in this pandemic, I've also seen that a couple of practical digital skills are rather poor just uploading a picture in a proper way in the, the, the right format proves to be a drama every now and then. So it probably has to be a mix. And I want to bring it over to Colin because Charlotte laid down two challenges eloquently, one against the traditional university system, perhaps I may be framing it in a, in, in a, in a little bit more oppositional mode than, than she did. But the other one was that how much could be done online. Colin, you emphasize the need to retain that person, to, to get back to that person-to-person -person contact and the role that that plays both in education and innovation. To what are the essentials? Why we want to hang on to some person-to-person -person contact? Well, what is it in, in, in groups? Uh, it's, it's something I've been puzzling about for the last six months, you know, as we kind of make a kind of incubator 2.0, you know, how, how do we support businesses? And, and what is missing? Well, you know, maybe in groups you eat together. Um, that's one small thing. But I, I think that, you know, innovation and ideas are snatched out of moments in time. And sometimes, you know, in our space, for example, people walk by and, you know, they have like 10, 10 minutes free to grab a coffee. And, and they're just, you know, spending about three minutes making coffee and they have these chats. And ideas and opportunities just, just fly by or, and, and kind of share and, and collaborate. Oh, by the way, this way you do that, you know? 
And there's just these chance encounters. I mean, which even from two weeks ago, a, a new a new founder entrepreneur in our space doing subsea cable reels. Turns out that one of the members in our space is is really like a buyer of these things. Okay, it's a it's a contractor. It's a major contractor, and he's he's the gatekeeper. But you know, you know, they they wouldn't have known this. I, I wouldn't have known this either. Um, but they were just you know, randomly talking about this with the coffee. So maybe some things which are lost is is precisely because innovation is very undetermined, right? It's very undetermined. So when we make a conference like this, we have to determine and plan, and we kind of forge this thing together, and we kind of carve out the time and space. But maybe innovation and ideas are so fleeting. And and the second thing is maybe it's based on trust, you know, and you've got to feel this kind of a, 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 a kind of trustful, trustful community they can feel at ease with. And maybe one way you can build that, you know, one way that happens is, well, again, we share the same space, you eat together, you have these fragments of, of, of trust. They kind of uh, give and share with each other. It is this feelings of, of trust and experience where academia and, and teaching you know, um, uh, brings about uh, that the best ideas, you know, it's not just the big ideas, but sometimes an, it's an idea within a company, say, within how company A or B or a university should innovate in its delivery of certain, you know, modules or certain uh, uh, topics. So it's not just the big innovations, it's small innovations as well. And, and together, you know, I think this makes the ecosystem, this makes what would be strong and what would keep us strong over the next you know, 10 years or five years, which maybe we're discovering right now. I really would like to stress this. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is extremely important nowadays, and there's all kinds of communication means for that. But it means that you first need to form your peer group, and that works best if you really meet the people face-to-face, -face, your fellow students, but also your teachers. Uh, so you know what their level is they're operating, you know what how you can trust them or whether you can not can trust them. Uh, so that's also a, a pro argument for, for the peer-to-peer, -peer, for the face-to-face -face meetings. Uh. I want to take a brief opportunity to bring this back to a comment that I made yesterday. Uh, and it, this is as a challenge out to the audience, actually. So what Colin has just expressed is, is really to say if, that if we had this live and say we were at Niagara-on-the-Lake, uh, many of you would have time to to have a meal together. You might go for a walk through the lovely, lovely town setting, uh, enjoy the scenery, begin a conversation. Out of that is, is the way that innovation often occurs. That is not intentional, but rather, rather that sort of uh, casual interaction that then leads to at some point a spark. There's been terrific dialogue in the chat, but I, I guess the point is, is that we have, we have a, very diverse group, a substantial group. Many of you don't know each other. You've seen comments in the chat, you've put comments in the chat. It might be an opportunity to, and it, it's a bit of a challenge to see if digitally you can, you can come up with those kind of innovations that would have, would have definitely happened if this had been a live event. Charlotte, I'm gonna put you on the spot here, uh, again, because you're the digital entrepreneur how can we make that happen? How can our participants actually get more out of this experience than simply having, you know, listening to us, which of course I'm sure has been, has been terrifically insightful for them, but how can they as a group sort of generate that creative spark? I, was, I, I can share my experience. I take an experience uh, because right now, and uh, even I'm a tech entrepreneur, I'm also a student and I'm studying uh, machine learning and data science online. So I have my classmates and at the beginning you can say that, okay, maybe they're going to learn online, they can't kind of physical aspect, but today there is social media, right? And we have different group on WhatsApp and Slack, different group, and we are supporting each other in terms of learning. I mean, if I'm learning something online and maybe I don't understand or have some challenges, I can come back to my group and share and we can still learn like that. And we have also some uh, live calls. I mean, the, it's on YouTube, you can have this kind of, even can have this on Facebook too. It's a live aspect, you teach your students and you can ask questions at, at the same time. And this kind of process make people don't feel that they are maybe alone in their house and learning. They feel that they are together. They can learn from each other, they can share experience and they can relate. 
And even we go far again. Normally, if I have to go to a traditional uh, education, uh, I be in maybe in Ghana and with Ghanaian students, I don't have this kind of open mindset. But because I'm learning online in my class, I have students from uh, US, UK, uh, Canada, India, from everywhere, from different places in the world. And I can see, okay, I can just to have a kind of experience. Okay, maybe after but after my certification, what I can do, what they can do in the country, how they relate, and it's really a uh, is is a good advantage. It's something we don't have in traditional aspects, right? It's a good advantage for us. But I have to come back something to understand that we can change the feeling we have being in the class, a physical class, being with friends. You can change this feeling. It will be different forever. You can change because this is like being with people. Being, I mean, even right now, some family that complain about the fact that the students, uh, the children, are too much of focus of gadgets, devices. And not focus having a kind of family um, or experience. I understand this. If we can change this, because it's different, it's something we can change. But the world is also changing, and if we want to adapt, we have to adapt based on what we have right now. And unfortunately, I, I, I can't say I'm 100% for online platform or online uh, activities, but it's what it is. It's right now, it's, it's what is going on. Social media is taking over the world, right? People are calling the friend that are connecting over the world. So right now, what we are doing is connectivity. I'm able to communicate, to share my experience based from Africa, to share this to a, uh, I know just from many countries, right? It's possible because we are doing this online. If it was physical, I'm not sure you have maybe the money to afford the trip and go there and share my experience. But I can do that right now. Thank you so much. I, I, I expected you would be able to contribute to that, that comment. Um, so I, I we're we're getting close to the end. I wanted to touch upon something that I wonder. Well, first of all, Charlotte, I have to admit I I've got a, a couple of daughters uh, that are about your age, uh, and it was only during this shutdown that I came to view a Zoom dialogue as actually meeting a person physically. And so now, now I've kind of adapted to this digital framework. So it's like when if you ask me, when was the last time I saw a certain person? I'm almost certainly referring to a Zoom call. Whereas previously, I would have said a telephone call or a Zoom meeting is different from face to face. And I would have gone yeah. to that face to face meeting. I'm wondering about the hybrid. I'm wondering if we're going to become more adept at this, where we will be able to have, it'll be more seamless that yes, I'm, I'm gonna to contribute to the meeting, but I happen to be doing it from home or I happen to be doing it because I'm in Africa. What, what are your views on this? Are, is, that, is that something that's going to have value and is that something that the technology is going to enable? TAS is a, it's a rather, so I have a rather unique perspective because TAS is quite unusual. You know, um, it, it sees itself as a global ecosystem and it does have these, you know, labs and presences and then we help um, facilitate business, basically. We help members facilitate business with each other or, or our portfolio companies. And um, so I guess to answer the question, you know, John, um, and I fully agree with that. And, and I fully agree with what, what you've experienced. I mean, I, I think that we have, we have been getting more and more adept and meeting online only. And then um, some best practices I found have sort of emerged as well. Here, I'm, I'm not talking about just, uh, you know, conferences or meetings. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about sort of introductory meetings where business will flow, you know, or a few million pounds of, um, you know, say, uh, investments may potentially flow or, or, or business, you know, gets built up in a few, you know, a few years, for example. And, um, and I think um, best practice wise, I guess, two things, you know, I mean, firstly, it's, it's, it's a culture thing. So different countries with different expectations of, of, um, of, of how to do an introduction and, and how they would feel comfortable. And, and I guess I've, I felt I've learned to be, to be really quite sensitive around this. I think we all do, we, we all must as well. And that's one of the, the great things about what's happening now. And, and the second is um, maybe smaller groups. Um, so the size of a group, Pertaining to the size of, well, to the import of the meeting that may, needs to take place. And maybe this is a new social phenomenon that will, that will take place as well, that will start now. 
uh, you know, as we kind of examine, you know, what's the best way to, to conduct a virtual meeting? Because I think that, um, I think I would say that these virtual meetings are very, very real. And maybe before the pandemic, you know, I would think it's not real. It's not really a meeting, you know, a, a Skype meeting. It's not really a meeting. You know, we, yeah, we will meet up, you know, a few, a few weeks time or we do meet up already. Right. But, um, but now we are forced internally as teams, uh, even within our respective organizations and then between organizations. And then we do and transact these deals as well virtually. So, so uh, I think it's a very interesting time, exciting space in a minute. Um, I hope, hope that answers the questions. Um, I think, I think, no, it, it, I think it really does. Thanks for listening to this episode of Big Ideas for a Changing World. This show was produced by Jesse Park and edited by Dan Kim of the Faculty of Engineering. Special thanks to GBC and Petrus for organizing the industry forum in partnership with McMaster Engineering and also for allowing us to share it with all of you today. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or let us know your thoughts on social media. We're at McMaster Engineering on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. See you next time.